Welcome to the congregation of Yahweh. We're here on Yahweh's Sabbath day, the day of Yom Teruah. Uh, today's message is just going to be covering, you know, uh, some of the significant things going on during the feast, uh, behind the scenes and how some things tie together. You know, the reason we're all here today is because we understand the significance of being the seed of Abraham. We realize that the Messiah did not come to start a new religion or to usurp the religion or the faith that was uh, passed down from uh, his ancestors and we realize that uh, the church is not a new entity and that the congreg congregation of Israel was his called out people and the the feast days have been you know discarded and, and overlooked by the twisting of scriptures taking things out of context and uh, I want to first touch on Colossians chapter 2 which is you know one of the most used verses to do away with and I'm just gonna I'm not gonna go into great detail we've, we've studied these things in depth in many other messages but I just want to point out a few things in Colossians chapter 2 verse 14 it says blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us which was contrary to us which uh, and took it out of the way nailing it to his stake or nailing it to his cross uh, everybody wants to nail something to the stake uh, most of, of mainstream Christianity likes to nail the Mosaic law to the cross you have some divisions that like to nail the feast days or circumcision to the cross but it's very easily explained in the verse right before it and you being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh hath he quickened together with him having forgiven you all trespasses it was our trespasses that were nailed to the cross when he became sin for us that is what was taken uh, to the stake and it says that these ordinances were against us uh, there's nothing in his Torah that was against us it was designed to bless us to give us longevity to keep us free from disease and if we obey these things blessed we would be going in and coming out blessed would be the fruit of the womb blessed would be our cattle everything that we came in contact with would be blessed if we observed, observed his word but if we didn't that is when it was against us if you don't do these things then you will be cursed so it's obvious what was against us was our transgressions and if we go down to verse uh, 16 here it says let no man therefore judge you in meat or in drink or in respect of a holy day or of the new moons or of the Sabbath days which are a shadow of things to come now many interpret this it's actually interpreted the opposite of the writers intention they they say well if I don't keep the Sabbaths or if I don't keep the holy days don't let anyone judge you but what it's actually saying is when the uncircumcised when those of the nations come in and keep these things don't let the world judge you in your observance uh, and it says in verse 17 which are a shadow of things to come you know for years I thought this in my mind I thought it said were were a shadow but no it says are at the time of this writing they still point forward to future events that had not happened yet and it says but the body of Messiah people interpret this as he was the body and the feasts were the shadow now that we have the body we don't need the shadow but he he's actually finishing up a thought process here in 16 it says let no one judge you and in verse 17 but the body of Messiah we judge things inside the body so the body reference here has nothing to do with the shadow reference in um, Luke chapter 22 this is just another simple way to show that these things are not fulfilled that they weren't done away with chapter 22 and verse 15 
the Messiah speaking, says, And he said unto them, With desire I have desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I say unto you, I will not any more eat thereof until it be fulfilled in the kingdom of Yahweh. So this verse alone shows that the very first feast that was ordained for Israel will not be fulfilled until he eats it in the kingdom. So now, today, the day of trumpets. Why are we here on the day of trumpets? Now, uh, they were told on the first day of the seventh month to blow the trumpet. And we were supposed to do it because he said to do it. And we get glimpses in scriptures of things that kind of tie in. Some believe that uh, this day is a foreshadow of at the sound of the last trumpet. The dead of Messiah shall rise first. That's in. We'll cover that in a minute. But there's actually another trumpet that is to be blown. Another last trumpet. And that is on the day of Yom Kippur. And these things are so close together, which is you know only uh, 15 days of separation of these feasts, uh, I believe the fulfillment of these things are also going to be close together. But let's look at 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And we're going to just go through uh, several scriptures and kind of pull this puzzle together of how things could possibly relate. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 51. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed, meaning not everyone is going to die. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. Meaning some will be alive at his return, at the sound of the last trump, and some will be changed. In a moment. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. And... We'll start in verse 13 of chapter 4. But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that you sorrow, not even as others which have no hope. For if we believe that Yeshua died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Yeshua will Elohim bring with him. For this we say unto you by the word of Yahweh, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Master shall not prevent them which are asleep. For the Master himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of Elohim, and the dead in Messiah shall rise first. With the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of Elohim, and the dead of Messiah shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the master in the air. And so shall we ever be with the master. You know, I'm not going to get too deep into the, the rapture theory today. But there's only two verses in scripture. This particular verse in John chapter 14 that make people believe when the Messiah returns, they're going to get zapped off to planet heaven. And they, uh, they mix that with there'll be two in the field, two in the bed. And two at the mill. One should be taken, the other one shall be left. And, you know, numerous volumes of, of movies and things have, be, have been concocted based off of just a few small verses. But what's striking is it's not found in Scripture. Amos chapter 3 verse 6, 6 or 7, one of the two, says, Yahweh does nothing without revealing it to his servants, the prophets. If you want to test the doctrines that are going on today in the churches, see if you can find it in the prophets. And most of what they're teaching out there is not found. And um, so what should we be looking for? What was Israel looking for? They were looking for a king to come and conquer. They were looking for a regathering of the house of Israel. They were looking for the enemies of Israel to be smitten and a Messiah to rule with righteous judgment and teach the law of Yahweh. That's what they were looking for. They weren't looking to be zapped off to another planet and leave their clothes laying on the ground. And everybody's saying, what happened? Where did everybody go? That's not in Scripture. And we will find in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 that it doesn't say you're going anywhere. 
it says you're meeting him. Also in John chapter 14, it says, yes, he's going to prepare a place. But then it says he's coming here to receive you unto himself. So when the Messiah returns, he's coming here. What, what was his prayer? Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That is what we should be looking for. So how does this, how does this tie in? Why are we meeting or you know, whoever is here at this time? Why are they meeting the master in the air? Let's look at Matthew chapter 24. At the beginning of 24, they ask, what are the signs of these things? What is the signs of the end of the age? Uh, in some translations, it says the end of the world, but that kind of leads us to believe that this earth will be done away with. But that's not what it's saying. What is the end of this age? What are the signs of your coming? And uh, you can go back and you know read some of these signs for yourself, but I want to I uh, get to the point here in verse uh, 26. Wherefore, if they shall say unto you, Behold, he is in the desert, go not forth. Behold, he is in the secret chambers, believe it not. For as the lightning comes out of the east and shines even unto the west, so shall the coming of the Son of Man be. Does that sound like a secret zapping away? Revelation says, Every eye will see him. And I'm not, I can't remember what verse. Uh, that was, but it's going to be seen as lightning shines from the east to the west. And this is a cryptic uh, statement here. The next one, for wheresoever the carcass is, there will the eagles be gathered together. And if you read the story in Luke, it says one shall be taken, the other one shall be left. And they said, well, where are they going to be taken? And he says, wheresoever the eagles are there, the, the carcass will be. Those who are taken will be taken and fed to the fowls of heaven. We don't want to be taken. <laughs> we want to be left. Um, and some translations say, wheresoever the carcass is there, the vultures shall be gathered together. But continue on in verse 29. Immediately after the tribulation of those days shall the sun be darkened, and the moon shall not give her light, and the stars shall fall from heaven, and the powers of the heavens shall be shaken, and then shall appear, another sighting, then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven, and then shall all of the tribes of the earth mourn, and they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. I don't see how we can get a secret disappearing out of this. Every eye will see him and he's coming in glory. And he shall send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet. There's that trumpet again. He returns in glory with the sound of the trumpet. There will be a resurrection and people will meet him in the air. And it goes on to say that at the sound of that trumpet, they shall gather together his elect from the four winds from one end of heaven unto the other. They are gathering his elect from the heavens. So how do we tie this in with what the prophets said would happen? There would be a regathering to the land. That's what's going on here. A lot of people call it the greater exodus. In Jeremiah chapter 16, it says, A time is coming when they will no more say Yahweh lives that brought us up out of the land of Egypt, but Yahweh lives that brought us into the land. And they believe that there is a comparison going on here, that the bringing into the land is going to be so much greater from, than the departure from Egypt that it will not be remembered. And we see glimpses of the Exodus story found all throughout Scripture. We see it in Revelations. Um, they were supposed to put blood on the doorpost. Um, numerous places in Scripture there was some type of red sign. You've got, I believe it's in Ezekiel, the, the angels with the ink horns. Um, Rahab with the red scarlet uh, on her, her door. You have, in Revelations, you have those that are marked with the seal. All of the imagery that we see in the Exodus story is seen in Revelations. It says that he, was, he brought them out on eagle's wings. Well, there's a, there's a group in Revelations that's uh, taken into the wilderness on eagle's wings. Um, but anyway, I'm getting off on a rant. But they come out of Egypt and they go through the Red Sea, which Paul said that is a symbol of baptism. So when we depart, 
you know, as they were in slavery, we depart from the slavery of sin and we head to the Red Sea of baptism. And when we come out on the other side of water, we leave Pharaoh, Satan, behind. We leave him on the other side of the water and we make our way to the mountain. And what happens at the mountain? He teaches us of his ways. And that mountain story was an allegory of the return of the Messiah. Right now, he is bringing people out of Egypt, the bondage of sin. He is leading people into the sea to get baptized. He's taking people to the mountain to await his second coming. What happened at the mountain? It says that, um, well, let's go back there. Let's go to Exodus chapter 19. This is a foreshadow of the return of our Messiah. And all of the imagery here that, we, that we're reading here is also found in Revelations. Let's look at uh, chapter 19 and verse 3 of Exodus. And Moses went up unto Elohim, and Yahweh called unto him out of the mountain, saying, Thus shalt thou say to the house of Jacob, and tell the children of Israel, You have seen what I did unto the Egyptians, and how I bear you on eagles' wings, and brought you unto myself. He is bringing people out of slavery unto himself at the mountain and that's where the Messiah will return now therefore if you will obey my voice indeed and keep my covenant then shall you be a peculiar treasure unto me above all people for all the earth is mine and you shall be unto me a kingdom of priests and a holy nations it's interesting that in revelations he is forming him, himself kings and priests why? What was the role of kings and priests? To rule righteously according to his Torah. And when the Messiah returns, he is returning with the pure word of his father's law, his father's Torah. And he's going to use those kings and priests that he's going to reign with for a thousand years. He's going to use them to teach his Torah. And during that thousand years, Satan will be bound and it will be a time to uh, remove the confusion and scales of tradition and actually learn the things that everybody's dividing and debating about right now. He's going to give it to us just the way it is. Um, so continuing on, you'll be a kingdom of priests and a holy nations. These are the words which thou shalt teach, shalt, excuse me, speak to the children of Israel. And Moses called, came and called for the elders of the people and laid before their faces all these words which Yahweh commanded and all the people answered together and said all that Yahweh has spoken we will do and Moses returned the words of the people to Yahweh we just read what the covenant was ladies and gentlemen it was not the feast days it was not the Sabbath it was not the dietary laws it was not the rest of scripture he said if you obey me I will be your L and you will be my people and they said okay we'll do it that was the covenant that was the agreement. Later on, the next chapter, that's when he revealed what he wanted done. But the covenant was, if you obey me, I will be your L and you will be my people. And they said, we will do it. They entered into that agreement. Um, and if we scroll down here... Um, well, I'll continue on. Verse 9. And Yahweh said unto Moses, Lo, I come unto thee in a thick cloud, that the people may hear when I speak with thee, and believe thee forever. And Moses told the words of the people to Yahweh. And Yahweh said unto Moses, Go unto the people, sanctify them today and tomorrow, and let them wash their clothes. And be ready against the third day, for the third day Yahweh will come down in the sight of all the people upon Mount Sinai. And thou shalt set bounds unto the people round about, saying, Take heed to yourselves, that you go not up into the mountain, nor touch the border of it. Whosoever toucheth the mount shall surely be put to death. There shall not a hand touch it, but he shall surely be stoned or shot through, whether it be beast or man. It, it shall not live. When the trumpet sounds long, they shall come up to the mountain. And when his trumpet sounds, that's where we're headed, to the mountain. We'll get more, more on that in a minute. And Moses went down from, mount, from the mount unto the people and sanctified the people, and they washed their clothes. In Revelations, it says that this group, these kings and priests, washed their robes in the blood of the land and made, made and, um says they follow the lamb wheresoever he goes. And Moses went down from the mount unto the people and sanctified the people and they washed their clothes. And he said unto the people, Be ready against the third day. Come not at your wives. Possibly tying in with Revelations where it says they are virgins. And Paul said that he 
had presented the church as a chaste virgin. So it's allegorically, not literal. And it came to pass on the third day in the morning that there were thunderings and lightnings and a thick cloud upon the mountain and the voice of the trumpet exceedingly loud so that all the people that was in the camp trembled. This verse is just about quoted verbatim in Revelation. It says there was an ark seen in the heavens and there were lightnings and thunders and you know all that. Anyway, and Moses brought forth the people out of the camp to meet with Elohim, and they stood at the nether part of the mount. And Mount Sinai was altogether on smoke, because Yahweh descended upon it in fire, and the smoke thereof ascended as the smoke of a furnace, and the whole mount quaked greatly. And when the voice of the trumpet sounded long, and waxed louder and louder, Moses spake, and Elohim answered him by a voice. And when that trumpet sounds long, the voice of Yahweh his word will be coming in the clouds of heaven. Hallelujah. And it's interesting that right before this chapter, I believe this is also allegorical of the kings and priests. In chapter 18 and verse 21, it says, Moreover, thou shalt provide out of all the people able men, such as fear Elohim, men of truth, hating covetousness, and place such over them to be rulers of thousands and rulers of hundreds, rulers of fifties and rulers of tens. Let them judge the people at all seasons, and it shall be that every great matter they shall bring unto thee, but every small matter they shall judge, so shall it be easier for thyself, and they shall bear the burden with thee. If thou shalt do this thing, and Elohim command thee so, then shalt thou be able to endure, and all this people shall also go to their place in peace. So Moses hearkened to the voice of his father-in-law, and did all that he had said. And Moses chose able men out of all Israel, and made them heads over the people, rulers of thousands, rulers of hundreds, rulers of fifties, and rulers of tens. And they judged the people at all seasons, the hard cases they brought to Moses, but every small matter they judged themselves. Um, now, this last trumpet issue, let's look at a, a couple other things that tie in with we've we've seen when the trumpet blows, uh, his commandments are going to be heard. When the trumpet blows, there will be a resurrection. There will be a regathering. Uh, Isaiah chapter 27 and also at the sound of the trumpet, there will be a gathering to the mountain. Chapter 27 and verse 13. It shall come to pass in that day that the great trumpet shall be blown. And they shall come which were ready to perish in the land of Assyria and the outcasts in the land of Egypt and shall worship Yahweh in the holy mount in Jerusalem. Let's look at Isaiah chapter 2. Isaiah chapter 2 and verse 2. And it shall come to pass in the last days that the mountain of Yahweh's house shall be established in the top of the mountains and shall be exalted above the hills and all nations shall flow to the mountain. And many people shall go and say, Come you, let us go up to the mountain of Yahweh to the house of the Elohim of Jacob and he will teach us of his ways and we will walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth the law and the word of Yahweh from Jerusalem in the last days a mountain will be established and his law his Torah his word will go forth from Zion and I believe that will be accomplished through kings and priests in Ezekiel 34 be closing out here in just a minute Ezekiel 34 concerning the two flocks he has scattered sheep and in verse 5 it says and they were scattered because there is no shepherd the way the sheep get scattered is by not having a shepherd that's feeding them and they're supposed to be fed on green pastures which is the word and they need water which is the spirit but the false shepherds trample the pastures and muddy the waters and they only feed themselves. In the Gospels it says that the Messiah looked at the crowds and had compassion on them because they were, they were as sheep that had no shepherd. And I guarantee you he had this in mind. 
for the sake of time, you know, you can go back and read the rest of that chapter. But let's pick up in verse 11 here. For thus saith my sovereign Yahweh, Behold I, even I will both search out my sheep and seek them out. As a shepherd seeks out his flock in the day that he is among his sheep that are scattered, so will I seek out my sheep and will deliver them out of all places where they have been scattered in the cloudy and dark day. And I will bring them out from the people and gather them from the countries and will bring them into their own land, the greater exodus, and feed them upon the mountains of Israel. They will be fed with his word on the mountains of Israel. Now he's gathering people out now. There's people starting to wake up and realize that they are the scattered sheep or they have been invited to come in with the scattered sheep. But, but the fulfillment of being brought into the land will be accomplished when the Messiah returns. And um, let's look at Revelation chapter 11. So this, this conquering king is coming at the sound of the trumpet. He's gathering all his people to the mountain. He's raising up kings and priests to teach his word, his Torah. The nations, the Gentiles, the nations will flow <laughs> to this mountain. Hallelujah. Let's see what else happens at the sound of the last trump. Revelations chapter 11 and there's a series of seven trumpets here seven angels having seven trumpets and this ties in very well with Joshua chapter 6 where you have seven days which could possibly tie in with us leading up to the seventh day the millennium the day of rest when Satan is bound. But on the seventh day you have seven priests having seven horns and they blow and the wall of the city crumbles and we see in revelations that at the sound of the seventh trumpet Babylon we sang that today in a song as a matter of fact <laughs> Babylon has fallen has fallen but in verse 15 it says and the seventh angel sounded and there were great voices in heaven saying the kingdom of the kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Messiah Excuse me, our sovereign and his Messiah, and he shall reign forever and ever. There was an angel in Luke, I believe it was chapter 1, that, that told Mary, it says, This child is going to be given the throne of David his father, and he will rule over the house of Israel forever. Why aren't people in the mainstream looking for that to happen? I'm looking for a Messiah to come and sit on the throne of David, his father, and to rule over Israel forever. Here it says that he will rule forever and ever. Let's look at Daniel chapter 2. Daniel chapter 2. And it talks about, uh, there's, there's an interpretation of a dream. And this, this big image is actually a time period of kingdoms. You have uh, gold and, and silver, gold and silver and brass and iron and, and feet mixed with iron and clay. And it's a timeline. And you start with Babylon and the Medo persian Empire and the Greeks and Rome and then a division. But at the very end of this vision, you see a stone coming out of heaven and just shattering this thing. And this is the fulfillment of that stone coming down in verse 44 of chapter 2. And in the days of these kings shall the Eli of heaven set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed. And the kingdom shall not be left to other people, but it shall break in pieces and consume all of these kingdoms and it shall stand forever. At the sound of the last trump, every kingdom that thinks it's a kingdom now will be demolished and put down to an everlasting kingdom by a king that's coming to teach the commandments that have been twisted, done away, made obsolete through the twisting of scripture. And um, these people, I'm kind of backtracking a little bit, these people that were to come to the mountain they were to sanctify themselves, make themselves ready, and get prepared to hear the word that was going to meet them on the mountain. What were they supposed to do when they left the mountain? Let's look at Deuteronomy chapter 4. Verse 
Verse 1, Now therefore hearken, O Israel, unto the statutes and unto the judgments which I teach you, for to do them, that you may live and go in and possess the land which Yahweh your Elohim your fathers gives you. Going back into the land. You shall not add unto the word which I command you, neither shall you diminish anything from it, that you may keep the commandments of Yahweh your Elohim which I command you. The only way to keep his commandments is by not adding to it or taking from it. As soon as you add to his word, you have canceled out the way to obey his commandments. And as soon as you take anything from it, you have canceled the way to keep his commandments. We do not have the authority to tamper with it in any way, shape, or form. Now, we can say that a lot of it does not apply to us because of the state that we're in. Okay, we can say it doesn't apply, but we cannot say it's done away with. Verse 3. Your eyes have seen what Yahweh did because of Baal Peor. For all the men that followed Baal Peor, Yahweh thy Elohim, hath destroyed them from amongst you. But you that did cleave unto Yahweh your Elohim are alive, every one of you this day. And, you know, I kind of foresee him saying that when he returns. You that cling to me are alive this day. You who cling to me were changed in the twinkling of an eye. You that cleave to me have met me at the mountain the way the ancient Israelites did. Behold, I have taught you statutes and judgments, even as Yahweh my Elohim commanded me that you should do so in the land whether you go, <laughs> whether you go over to possess it. You know, Moses is saying but that, but I see it coming out of the mouth of Yeshua. Yeshua is saying, Behold, I have taught you statutes and judgments, even as Yahweh my Elohim commanded me that you should go into the land uh, whether you go to possess it. Keep therefore and do them, for this is your wisdom and your understanding in the sight of the nations, which shall hear all these statutes and say, Surely this great nation is wise and understanding people. For what nation is there so great who hath Elohim so near unto them as Yahweh our Elohim is in all things that we call upon him for? And what nation is there so great that hath statutes and judgments so righteous as all this law which I set before you this day? Paul said that the commandments are holy and righteous and good and that they are spiritual. And that spiritual minded people mind spiritual things. But the answer to the questions, what were they to do when they left the mountain? To be a light to the nations. To preserve his commandments, to preserve his word in the way that they lived. And that other nations would see it and say, wow. What an amazing, wise and understanding people this is. How close is Yahweh to them. Look at these. Look at this word that they carry with them. And it was a, to be a sign to the nations. Hallelujah. Hallelujah.